morning uh, everyone so our ic will start may prolong the surgical they are managing their cases to uh, overcome this obstacle so our heart is with them first of all i'd like to thank dr boral for giving me this opportunity well i will be presenting quite simple cases uh, which got complicated and it was not planned as we did so my longest cases uh, these are the four complications which i am going to show the first one is a simple case of dislocated owl as you can see uh, just a dropped owl just doing an vitreous shave so that i don't pull the vitreous while removing the owl things were fine till this level Now something happened. The eye is not coming out. It got stuck badly to the eye. So I thought it, it will just come out. It, it's just not coming, and it started bleeding profusely. Put some visco inside. Wait for some time, and then try it. doing a proper vitrectomy and a wish saving then it looked that bad uh, that stiff retina when i was draining from the nasal uh, side thick fluid is coming out and now something unusual happened from all the quadrants you can see the retina had split there is a tension retinotomy has happened it was at least 20 splits in the retina I was lucky that after set uh, with this training, it settled well. But uh, the retina was so stiff. Maybe it gave through, and it was not. At least uh, when we started the surgery, it was not that stiff. It looked like that. And I have never come across a case like this where the retina had multiple slits and it settles by. Coming to the third case, this is also a simple case of a large macula hole. Uh, there was some problem with the planning. We we we, we started peeling, but uh, while peeling, I I realized that this is a large one. I should have done a first peel, but that was 
to play. So I thought, okay, uh, we'll, we'll do a free flap technique in this case. But I was not prepared. My walls were, uh, my cannulas were not on board. This is uh, a very common scenario in a high myopic patient when we cannot reach the instrument in the posterior pole. This is what happened. I tried uh, to lift a flap with the finesse and then get the flap engaged with the uh, island peeling faucet. But, uh, I was unable to reach the posterior pole. So I had to actually this finesse loop. complication irrespective of the can be resolved with patients and Thank you. Thank you Dr. Vaiti for uh, showcasing so many unusual cases. So now uh, what do you think? What was your, what is the reason of like uh, haptic causes the IDD dialysis in that case, in the haptic? Usually it don't. Yeah, it's a, it's a very rare instance but uh, I think uh, while Removing the aisle, I should have kept, uh, I should have been more careful and the light pipe can can be used as a guide so that it, it doesn't touches the iris. Your uh, second case is also very unusual. Like uh, I have seen this uh, complication in our previous ICs also. But uh, uh, I have a question, like after removal of the silicon oil, whether you go, uh, got any like uh, recurrent recurrence of detachment? Yes, there was an inferior recurrence. Then I had put a buckle as well. And finally, the yeah. eye has been saved. Oh, and your third case, that how to prevent this? <coughs> you have already explained. You have to do the free island flap under PFCL. Yeah, and actually, the there was there was a lack of planning. Yes. The, the large macular hole. I thought I will do a uh, conventional so peeling. Then I decided so differently. The take home should be don't underestimate this type of cases because ILM in this case are very vital. They are like uh, you have to preserve it. So do it under PFCL, keep it over the hole and start doing fluid exchange and then remove the silicon uh, PFCL, direct PFCL with air exchange followed by gas injection. And it actually, it's a very technically difficult thing to do a free flap because yes. uh, many a times you might lose it. Yes, you know, this people, is a very common people underestimate these type of cases and they lose the, they used to. I think the initially you do an inverse peel technique that is much better. Any questions, Dr. Otto? Uh, I think uh, this uh, free flap technique, uh, the only problem was the one non wall cannula. Yeah. And yes, the yes. easiest solution is just to pinch the infusion cannula, tell the uh, assistant to pinch the infusion cannula, then there will be no turbulence yes. inside the eye. Yes. And the uh, island flap will be stayed there only okay. because of that. 
are you uh, going to use this uh, colored visco what yeah. you used to i'll i'll show the case Elon or uh, hpmc uh, i'm just using 2% hpmc which we are using for the cataract surgery okay uh, it's not a helon uh, that won't be detrimental for the hole closure no nothing i have okay. done a uh, thesis on uh, 30 eyes and okay. the uh, hole closure rate was 97% hmm. and uh, the full thesis are there in which uh, we have analyzed the ELM and the ISOS junction both. So yeah. at the end of the six month, uh, statistically significant difference in the vision and uh, both the whole closure rate in it's the case good. of ELM and the ISOS junction both. Dr. Kelkar, any comments? Especially the case where he had multiple tears. Yes. I don't know if uh, the traction was fully removed before the resting happened. Uh, uh, if in the case the traction was done properly. Mm, then unfortunate for you. <laughs> yeah, I have never seen such an uh, intrinsic case retinal case contraction are the answers. Like uh, yes, retina will try to relax under air. So, so our next presenter is uh, Dr. Devdulal Chakraborty. Thank you, Dr. Shubhendu Boral. Uh, Dr. Shubhendu Boral has been kind to, you know, include me in his course. So I'll be speaking on vitreous hemorrhage turning into a nightmare. So uh, this is the first case, a 43-year-old male with complaint of pain and decreased vision for six days. And uh, actually, the, he had a history of a drunken brawl six days back and was in police lockup for four days. So there also he got a thrashing. Now, when he came to me, finally the police left him. So he had a vision of uh, PL and PR, and uh, eye was soft. Uh, we couldn't measure the NCT or the AT. And uh, digitally, I thought it was very, very soft. And uh, there was no view of the fundus, of course. And as you can see, the vitreous, uh, you know, hemorrhage was there, and this area looked like a retinal detachment, uh, but wasn't sure really. So uh, let's look at the surgery. What happened? So uh, this was a little while back. So this was 23 gauge uh, surgery that we were doing. So as you can see, uh, it was a very, very soft eye. And uh, you know, you can see the dipping of the, you know, sclera and the eyeball. So finally, you know, it was a tough time, you know, kind of even putting in the trocker cannula. So finally, when we uh, released uh, the, you know, trocker, then you can see some, uh, you know, blood stained fluid coming out. So I thought that was probably and some coronal detachment and I then I put in the infusion and I wasn't uh, I was in a mess I couldn't really see where whether the infusion cannula was inside the you know vitreous cavity or not whether it was subretinal uh, so I didn't open up the infusion and we went in with the next port same story very soft with a lot of you know twisting and turning and see there's again egress of fluid so I thought okay so coronal detachment if it is there then it's taken care of Again, tried to see whether we are inside or not and couldn't find out. So finally, when I put in the cutter, I could see that, okay, the cutter could be, you know, seen. So I thought, okay, chalo, kam ho gaya. But actually, the devil was lurking inside. So what, uh, you know, s we, uh, when we put in the light pipe, so again, the light pipe seemed to be subretinal. The cutter was there, and it was very difficult to kind of see what actually we were, you know, doing. So I really wasn't, you know, sure about whether I was, still, you know, subretinal with the infusion cannula with regards to the infusion cannula. And so, you know, I thought uh, because of the staining of the posterior, uh, uh, you know, uh, PC that is uh, by the blood. So I thought uh, enough is enough and we need to actually, you know, uh, sort of uh, remove the uh, lens so that we have better, uh, you know, visualization. So uh, we remove the lens and once we remove the lens, we actually had, you know, uh, a better view of the, uh, you know, uh, whole thing. So we needed a phragmatome to remove the remaining part of the lens that was there. 
and after that this things became you know clearer so we could see that uh, you could see retina in some part and there was you know i start sort of started breathing normally so then we realized there was a retinal detachment here so uh, then gradually gradually what we did was basically we removed the peripheral vitreous and uh, we actually you know could see that it was a retinal detachment extending into three quadrants so as you can see because of uh, removing of the lens things became easier and uh, then of course you know it was uh, time to use transcendental night to see whether there was any you know vitreous left inside and whatever vitreous was there we removed it we did a base excision of this uh, patient and uh, then uh, you know obviously you need to do uh, fluid air exchange and uh, retina seemed to settle well and uh, finally of course you need to do as we uh, all know endo laser and uh, So, uh, so what uh, we missed out this small part. So we did endo laser, and finally what happened was uh, we actually, you know, uh, in the post-operative period it wasn't uh, really a bad uh, scenario, and patient actually we put in silicon oil of course in this patient, and patient actually gained 636 vision to my, uh, you know, satisfaction, and patient was also satisfied. And subsequently we did, did a silicon oil exchange uh, removal, and uh, we put in a secondary IUL, an iris glow IUL. So this was the first case, and uh, this was, uh, you know, the second case, a 73-year-old lady who actually, like Dr. Anirudh has just mentioned, that you need to really plan your cases properly, and it's a, it's a very important thing to do your own uh, ultrasound. So this is, a, uh, this is a lady, I had not done the ultrasound myself, and my fellow had done it, and uh, uh, I saw this paper on the day of, uh, of surgery, and this area actually, you know, looked suspicious to me. So there was uh, something in this area, these arrows you can see. So this area looked suspicious, and I thought there could be something, you know, subretinal or something. And it was not a case of simple vitreous hemorrhage that my fellow was telling me about. So initially we started off uh, doing the surgery. It uh, seemed like a routine kind of a, you know, vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, so we gradually removed the vitreous hemorrhage. And uh, uh, so we actually... Uh, after the uh, vitreous hemorrhage became uh, slightly, you know, we cleared the vitreous hemorrhage little by little. So here, in the posterior pole, there was this, you know, mound sort of a thing. I think Dr. Bikramjit is here, maybe. Oh, he's not here at the moment. So, you know, uh, so we had this mass here, and uh, so it was kind of, you know, it was nice and round and almost mushroom shaped but thankfully there was no retinal detachment next to it so I didn't know what to do actually at this point okay. in time. I was hoping it would be a macro aneurysm and considering her age I just hoped and prayed that it was not a melanoma and uh, uh, so I thought okay if it's a macro aneurysm it's going to be you know useful to do a little bit of laser and we did a surrounding kind of a barrage also just to you know ensure that like if it was something uh, that was kind of malignant, we, we were not, you know, disturbing the periphery and uh, burnt area in the periphery of the, of the lesion would probably help in, uh, you know, stopping the spread, lateral spread of any cells or anything. And then we tried to heat up the, you know, uh, this lesion, hope, again hoping that it's a macroneurysm and uh, this macroneurysm would kind of shrivel up, shrink up and uh, subsequent to the surgery. But uh, see what happened. We did the fluid air exchange, of course, and we le left it at that. And uh, then postoperatively, patient developed recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. So I wasn't able to see what was inside. The ultrasound was ominous. It had actually it had grown. This ultrasound, you know, uh, got the you know daylights out of me. Next, it was locked down. Patient could not come back, and I started calling the patient. Tried to arrange an ambulance. Finally, after 42 full days of the surgery, patient comes back and the lesion is kind of collapsed. Vision is 6-9, so all's well, that ends well. And you know, my BP became normal once again. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Devdulal, for uh, showcasing so uh, uh, nicely, you know, like nicely managed, interesting cases. So uh, 
I want to talk, uh, discuss regarding your first case. The problem in your first case was the patient, uh, the eye was hypotonous, and the second was the eye was faking uh, in the, your first case. Then a hypotonous eye, so what precautions you should have take, uh, taken like uh, before, just, just before initiation of the surgery? Yes, in a hypoton hypotonic uh, eye, it's it's a good idea to actually you know go into the anterior chamber with a with a you know with BSS and uh, kind kind of inflate it uh, with BSS so that you have a you know tighter kind of a globe. But the problem here is uh, even with a tight globe, you will still go subretinal because the uh, injection of BSS into the anterior chamber doesn't ensure that you know the the choroidal detachment is going to go away. So the problem persists that in this kind of a situation, you are really, you are not really sure where your cannula is. So ultimately, you know, this is a situation where either you use a 6 mm cannula, which I did not have at that uh, on that day. So you might need a 6 mm cannula only once in a year, but you have to have it in your routine. So that is an important thing to have. The second thing is that, you know, uh, visualization again, because you couldn't see anything, so ultimately the lensectomy was necessary, which we generally try and avoid doing nowadays. Like uh, how old is the patient? Patient is 31, was 31 was at the 31, time of surgery. Yes. The was cataract was not significant. Four or five years, yeah, no so cataract. Has so if possible, uh, is was it uh, like uh, possible to inject the BSS inside the vitreous cavity to re uh, raise the vitreous pressure and then go for the like Absolutely, you can do, uh, you know, injection of BSS into vitreous cavity. But again, the issue is you will not have the choroidals go away if it's a case of choroidal detachment. And if the patient is having little bit of cataract, you can plan for the risk cataract along with this vitreous cavity. Absolutely. Because there Absolutely. was with, uh, hemorrhagic detachment also. Absolutely. In but in okay. young patients, we are yes. generally try to avoid doing a cataract. So surgery. simple vitreous hemorrhage looks, seems to be simple, but they are not always simple. So that is the take home. You should always be very really careful, especially treating while treating the young patient. Any comment from Dr. Atul? They will also, in this case, you have gone, in the second attempt, you have gone from posterior to anterior. Means uh, you have started the lensectomy from posterior to anterior, and you are not able to see anything. So isn't it a better choice to go from anterior to posterior and start the, put a uh, anterior chamber maintainer and start the uh, lensectomy from anterior side? If FACO is possible, that then it's okay. Otherwise, if FACO is not possible and you're planning for the lensectomy also from anterior, because you're not able to see. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think, you know, because uh, the suckers, uh, 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 your point is well taken. Uh, my uh, you know, issue here was that I could see the sucker. Hmm? But I couldn't see the increasing cannula. I could see the sucker right between the legs. But that was it, nothing beyond that. So since the sucker was already inside, rather than making an anterior, you know, because all the fluid that was coming out through the scrotum, uh, the scrotum reports, all are yellowish color. That's yeah. choroidal fluid. Yeah. Yes. So, so even after that, I couldn't see. Any comment, Dr. Thomas? Yeah, the old uh, vitreous cases, which looks very simple, but it sometimes you know turn out to be very nightmare for any surgeon. But as you said very correctly, if you plan FACO combined surgery, it can be much better way. And um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. it's done. Yeah. We are going for our next uh, speaker, Dr. Aditya Kelkar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Boral. Uh, I'm going to present a short video on uh, a slip haptic while performing the MIA surgery. So that's the kind of situation I landed up with uh, a patient who has a high myo post RK, a dislocated whole back complex, and the surgery was going smooth. The rectum was done with EFCL injected to protect the posterior pole and. Uh, the forceps, the plan was to remove this back complex out. Everything was falling in place. The lens was levitated up using the vacuum and then put the forceps. I ensured that it doesn't slip back again. It was pulled out into the anterior chamber and it was all looking very spectacular. I was always, I mean, I was thinking I am the superstar of ophthalmology now. And then I have, uh, I had uh, recently seen a few videos of Dr. Yamane doing a nice uh, SFIOL. I thought, yeah.
yes this is the opportunity where i can showcase my skills carefully remove pfcl it was all going as per the plan and then the first haptic was introduced i use a 27 gauge needle because 30 gauge needle is not available because which is the low volume and that's the one which dr rahman uses so carefully i introduced the haptic into the needle and i started to think that i think i am dr yaman pulled it out first into the anterior chamber making sure that uh, it at least doesn't slip and the other haptic i asked the assistant to hold on to so that was important so that otherwise uh, to have both the haptics not found easily and under the iris would have been a mess so i ensured that the first haptic is in place and then we introduced this needle again same thing you can do if you have this uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage and you are not able to see the haptic clearly you can always extend i mean uh, make a conjunctival opening use a trocar cannula simple way to get this haptic out is using the forceps and then pulling it out that's another way of uh, managing this situation so then finally it all went well and the lens is in place So finally, you are our Yamani. <laughs> nice kiss. So, uh, yes. See, frankly speaking, it depends on the kind of situation that I am in. <laughs> If I am operating on a patient and on table, I have a. PC rent where the capsular support is inadequate i would generally end up doing iris claw iols because i think the time is very short to manipulate uh, the situation on table whereas if i have a patient who is like a planned aphakia patient for management i would generally do a sfiol either a sutured sfiol using a 60 proline or the yaman is sfiol sure I use the Indian intraocular lens that is available in the market, the six by eleven millimeters optic size, haptic size. Thank you, Dr. Maithi. You have any questions? I think it is uh, the excellence lens uh, which we use most commonly. N nowadays, I think two three companies has also come in. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thanks to Dr. Borel for inviting. Uh, uh, so I'll be showing the two cases here. The first case will be uh, drop nucleus, which is refer for the. Yes, Dr. Dharmesh.
and schedule fixation. I think this will be higher. So all of us should know the all the talking techniques. So what whenever it is required as an only required, you can just change your treatment plan also. Close. Dr. Debulal, yes. I just want to ask one question from you. Uh, in here, yeah. in Dr. Mathai case, if you'll find a large maculophone on a table, whether you'll go with your technique of macula massage or not? I have given up all my techniques. I have given up all my And what's the biggest macular hole you have operated by this technique? 1800. Six plus. 1800. 1800. Yeah. By macular massage only. Yeah. Great. Okay, Dr. Dharmesh. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Good morning. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, so we'll show the two cases. The first case is very simple case. Refer with the drop nucleus for vitrectomy and secondary IOL. We always think in the simple case, we start the case and Yeah, so it's we can just see the nucleus and at the plan we will start the surgery, plan for Sondelia, the nucleus was seen. So at the beginning it was very simple. So after going inside we found that that's the RD also. And along with the RD we can see some nucleus fragment which has gone subretinally. So suddenly it has become a long case and it was never ending. So we did uh, alum peeling under PFCL and still lots of uh, matter we can see. Did a retinotomy to remove the larger piece and smaller piece was very difficult even with the help of PFCL to remove. So it was followed by the uh, secondary IOL and the uh, end result was good. The second case is as you say the sleepless night. So we had a one TDR case with TRD and FVP. We have planned this case that uh, this will require a long time and uh, the total macula was covered with the membrane. anti vegf was given uh, two days before. As we started vitrectomy from periphery, we can see there's lots of focal attachments. It's very difficult with the help of only cutter to remove each and every attachments and we are trying to prevent the at atrogenic breaks. You can see that the retina is very ischemic, so any manipulation can lead to more breaks which we don't want in at least diabetic cases. That's time we have planned to uh, shift to a bimanual
anything if you just try to do the PVD or just try to give any traction and because of lots of focal attachments you know there's a very uh, fear of coming to Is it the same looping it I is going on? No, no, huh, it's, it's just because yes, this one. No, no, no. Here the previous one. Here, the, we then we shifted uh. to a bimanual surgery, and we try to meticulously cut and remove all the attachments, and prevent the breaks on the retina, especially in the macular areas. can use the cutter tip in between or there is a proportional hydro uh, dissection we can do to just find the exact plane of dissection in such cases. And these cases really require lots of patience but finally able to remove the full membrane but there are still few attachments if you're able to cut with in between the attachment with the help of cutters and at the end able to laser it and able to settle the retina very well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dharmesh. Uh, usually, uh, in all uh, diabetic retinopathies, they are not uh, like simple. They uh, sometimes you think in ultrasonography, uh, you we can't uh, detect the the, this membranous proliferation, flat TRDs. Now, uh, during the surgery, you will see a lot of attachments, multiple focal additions. So, uh, any comments from Dr. Maiti? Yeah, uh, Dr. Borel, do you think this kind of cases needs to be done ILM peeling? Because in Dharmesh case also, there was a little bit of puckering underneath the tractional retinal detachment, the fibrovascular proliferation. Yes, if I see there is the macula is quite boggy on table because preoperatively uh, OCT in many times it is not possible because of hemorrhage of media headedness or cataract. So in those cases, ILM peeling would be beneficial after removal of all the membranes. Dr. Atul. Uh, sir, I have found that uh, the chances of tear is much more if you pull the membrane from the forceps 
towards the center of the vitreous cavity. Hmm. If you'll keep over the surface of the retina, the chances, the pulling force will not be there. We have to just support the membrane over the surface of the retina and then from the scissor, we can cut the attachments. So but just to, to visualize, because it was so many multiple attachments. Th th so that's just what I'm if, if you the, the if you are pulling the the flap like this, you will pull the flap. If you keep the flap over the surface of the retina, mm. the pulling force will not be there. We have to just keep it over the retina, and yeah. then we have to yeah. cut, cut all the attachments. And uh, uh, one question I want to ask from Bural sir: At what IOP usually you are doing the surgery? Diabetic 35 surgery. to 40. 40 sir. 35 to 40, not more than 40, usually. But if there is a bleeding tendency, like a lot of oozing, but still you have to, I have to complete my procedure, then I am going above 40. Okay. 40 to 50, 55 maximum. Okay. Uh, from the last two, two and a half years, sir, I am doing the surgery at around 15, 20 IOP. Okay. And uh, bleeding point, I am cauterized, and I have found myself no study at this Low time. IOP surgery. Uh, the, the disc status is very well maintained yes. even after two or three years. To always, no like surgeries. yes, we, that's we why you should not keep your IOP more than forty. Yes, yeah. that is. Uh, otherwise, you don't know the whatever the your length of time that the disc is becoming com uh, compromised. So we, we can do between twenty-five to thirty and make yes. it sixty with the foot switch for just uh, temporarily. But as you very correctly say, cauterizing also help a lot. And keeping 60 will be more damaging on the... Dr. Raja, no, what sir. is your preferred choice of IOP? Diabetic vitrectomy. Yes. I usually keep at 25, my surgery. If there is a bleeding... I raise it to 60 temporarily, uh, but I most of my surgery is at 25. With 25, yes. Dr. Dedulal? Uh, IOP? With the 10,000 cutters, we generally are more inclined to do a unimanual surgery, I um, mean, like uh, or with yes. the right hand or the active mm -hmm. hand. But uh, when I see a membrane like this, I usually go in by, by manually, hmm. put in a chandelier. It cups, cuts the surgical time by half, and there's absolutely no, uh, you know, uh, very minimal chance of creating a break. Uh, so you can get away with, uh, with uh, you know, gas in most cases, most situations, and bad looking membranes also do really, really well. I think Dr. the Shantanu? main problem is to identify the plane, so which at times I think this proportional reflux do help. Yeah. But the, the newer bevel cutter of 25 gauge and yeah, 27 but you need gauge. To, you need to locate the plane, plane first. So that proportional reflux and the bevel cutter is yeah. really helpful. Dr. Dr. Shanturu? It needs patience, nothing else. It, in these cases, you have to be patient. Okay. Okay. So nice surgery, Dr. Dharmesh. So I'll invite uh, our next spe speaker, Dr. Shantanu Mandal. If I can just uh, add a few points here. Yes, yes, Dr. yes, Raja. Mandal said uh, patience is key. Ah. I, these are extremely difficult surgeries and you have to be trained. And actually under supervision, you have to do a few surgeries and only then someone should attempt these. Yes. Uh, some surgeries like uh, PBR, you know, people have seen somewhere in some conference uh, or with someone and can start doing it can be a little bit forgiving but this kind of case let's say by manual or diabetic you have to have a senior with you supervise you not just see in a conference and go back and start doing and the plain thing was so important that you mentioned that I have seen a few uh, surgeons 
which spread with cutter over the membrane, right? So if there is no plane, and you think you are uh, you are hoping that only the membrane will cut me into the cutter, and retina will not come there. It will never happen. Retina will also come into the cutter if there is no plane, and that's why it's a struggle, it's a patience, and you need to really, really learn the technique. So these are techniques which are being shown here to just add to the audience, but it cannot be that tomorrow someone starts doing straight away. Yes, absolutely correct. If the membrane is free and it is they are very mobile, they can you can do the fold back technique. You can keep your cutter just overlaying the membrane, the membrane will automatically come. Uh, if the membrane is totally attached, firmly attached, broad, uh, broad based additions, so m no membrane age will come into the cutter port. So, Dr. Shantanu, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, and thanks to Dr. Boral for giving me the opportunity. This is the third time. Last two times I presented my CSVSHMI video, but this time I think something different I need. You know, something, but there is two lines in my topic. One is my longest retinal detachment surgery, and second is longest day due to mis mas masquerading sign. So I just try to incorporate these two and make a single video. So I tried this, hope you will like. So this is a, this is an old video uh, in the era of Acuras. Uh, 54 years old male patient presented with dimness of vision in right eye for one year. Presenting vision in right eye PL, PR accurate and left eye 6-6. Six six. Right eye posterior synechia, posterior subcapsular cataract, IOP 6 and RAPD. Left eye clear lens, IOP 15 millimeter of mercury. Right eye total RD with extensive PVR changes, peripheral details not clear, very vascular malformation in the superonasal periphery. It's not clear in the preoperative assessment. Left eye FOH. So I have planned to go for cataract extraction with IOL implantation, with vitrectomy and silicon oil implantation.
patient in postoperatively patient gain 636 vision after removal of silicon oil from right eye. Hegler and North have reported that macro cyst medium sized isolated cysts are almost always seen in the long standing retinal detachment, usually it's more than three wrong. months duration. They have found in about 3% of the eyes undergoing retinal detachment surgery. Macrocysts are believed to result from degenerative changes in retina, and retinal macrocysts are fluid filled cavities that is not very different from the subretinal fluid. Occasionally, there may be blood within the cyst. Hemorrhagic retinal cysts have also seen, been described pathologically in eyes enucleated for advanced Coats disease. The possible reason for blood in the cyst could be <coughs> a rupture of the retinal blood vessels in the cyst cavity, and this could be a recurrent ph phenomenon. That's why I ruptured the cyst and flattened the retina. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shantanu. Uh, I have a few questions, like whether this cyst was preoperatively visible or not? No, not visible. It was there at the periphery? Some abnormal uh, vascularization, but uh, that is not clear due to the cataract changes. In the complicated cataract was there, media was also PVR yeah, changes, yeah. which as haze was there. So it was not, it was at very periphery. It's, it's, it's very periphery. such a large cyst, and what do you think it is? It is a sign of older age. And uh, hemorrhage. Three months. Hemorrhage is very uncommon. Uncommon. Uncommon, but uh, it it is uh, reported uh, 2011 in Oman Journal of Ophthalmology from Shankar Nechala. They uh, buckle the retinal detachment, mm -hmm. and they had a persistent cyst for the three years. Three years. That that is not settled because once that was the a scleral buckle surgery. The cyst automatically settled. That was a scleral buckle surgery. Buckle surgery. Buckle surgery. Hmm. So whether uh, the, you're uh, rupturing the cyst and draining the blood was at all necessary at this moment or not? Yeah, money, uh, re seeing re retrospectively because if the vessels is patent and if the vessel persists and there is a chance of recurrent hemorrhage in, inside the cyst and that will lead to a persistent cyst inside the cavity. That's opinion, Dr. Atul. So if this case comes to you today, whether you will rupture the cyst or not? After going through the all the literature, yes. so, so this nice case settled nicely. <laughs> this no. case settled nicely, but, but probably not. Because in this type of in this case, the primary break was uh, infranasal side. Yeah, yeah. It was quite far from your cyst. Yeah. It was quite far from, from your cyst, and cyst was not hindering in the settlement of the retina. No, no. but the, the posterior end of the cyst, the, the laser is not taken that no, time. Even if you will not do the laser, yeah, that just leave it like that for the next 5 years, 10 years or 20 years also, what, uh, what uh, harm it will do? Nothing. He, he was in fear of uh, recurrence of the hemorrhage or aggravation of this hemorrhage. Dr. Uh, Maiti? Will you will you rupture it or not? Because to make a m one more break, we yes, are we that we increase are the chance of PVR. Uh, increasing the chance of PVR formation. Yeah, that's true. And that's true. And in this case also, there was no buckle, belt buckle also, and it it was not supporting that area. Yeah. So that will no, increase. He has, the he has done the nicely basic uh, session. That uh, is true. But uh, rupture in the cyst means you are going to the intercyst cavity. Yes. So he is doing laser also. So I think uh, increasing chance of PVR is not nice. Yes. But okay. today, uh, in today's scenario, I am not going to rupture the cyst. He is not going to rupture the cyst. <laughs> <laughs> that is your. So all of us are with you, Dr. Atul. Now we are inviting you to present. Thank you, sir.
thank you boral sir for this uh, invitation and uh, today i am going to present no Uh, today i am going to present the longest day and the sleepless night but basically it is not the longest day and the sleepless night it is longest day and the quiet and cool and enjoyable night i i, I have tried to make the things Just as opposite. simple as possible as you can see in this picture one hero is there that is shahrukh khan and uh, he is playing the different type of roles in the different type of movies like this the lamella macular hole the pathology if we, if we want to deal with any disease we have to know the exact pathology of the disease the exact pathology of the disease of all the vitro macular uh, interface disorder is posterior vitreous detachment anamolus posterior vitreous detachment and uh, what is normal posterior vitreous detachment is the synergesis the, the liquefaction at the center and separation of the posterior cortex from the retina at the same time if there is a time difference is there if synergesis liquefaction will be faster than the separation it will lead to the all the vitro macular surface disorder nobody knows which case will go into the lamella macular hole which case will go to the pseudo hole which case will go for the erm and we have named them but the original pathology is the anamolus posterior vitreous detachment it can lead to the vitro macular adhesion traction full thickness macular pseudo hole or our today's topic lamella macular hole we have given the name they, they are not the different pathologies we have given the name of a simple thing that is abnormal posterior vitreous detachment now today i'll i'll talk about the i different technique to deal with the lamella macular hole a few thing about the lamella macular hole the witkins criteria for the lamella macular hole only four are there that is irregular foveal contour defect in the inner fovea intra retinal splitting at the outer plexiform layer outer plexiform layer this is most important i'll show in the video also how it happens and intact photoreceptor why the vision improves after the lamella macular hole surgery so enjoy this video one second audio please audio hey audio please
typical epiretinal membrane and on temporal side posterior vitreous detachment was present along with separation at outer plexiform layer. Following the extreme success of inverted internal limiting membrane flap technique by Michel Visca and extensive work by Shiode, surgeon decided to go for inverted ILM flap in this case too. The already given theory for lamellar macular hole formation is by vitreous separation and subsequent ERM formation leading to centrifugal traction. Surgeon has given a hypothesis that in tractional lamellar macular hole, main cause of vision loss is synaptic breakage at outer plexiform layer. Photoreceptors are most rigid cells in retina. Separation occurs at outer plexiform layer because in inner plexiform layer, more synapse per unit area are present. So if we remove this ERM traction and produce more pillars of Muller cells by ILM flap, that will lead to near normal foveal architecture and repeat synapse formation at outer plexiform layer. Surgeon started the surgery by intravitreal triamcelon assisted PVD induction followed by posterior highlight and ERM peeling. After this blend blue staining of ILM was done and peeling started with the plan to preserve a small piece of ILM for inverted flap. Unfortunately, ILM flap detached, so surgeon opted for plan B and took out a ILM piece and placed it over the hole with the help of color visco. After this, fluid air exchange was started. Just near the completion, surgeon found ILM flap was displaced from the hole and rolled over. So surgeon unrolled the flap with silicon tip cannula and perfectly placed it over the hole by the help of active suction of remaining visco from different directions. Surgeon named it as Colored Visco Suction Assisted ILM Transplantation. <coughs> At the end, air was replaced by SF6. After one month post-op, patient vision was 69 and N6. In this LMH, pre-op best corrected visual acuity was 636 N10 and post-op best corrected visual acuity was 69 N8. So, color visco suction assisted ILM flap placement technique is easy and reproducible. Thank you. In fact, color visco suction assisted ILM fla flap placement. Typical epiretinal membrane uh, and on temporal side, posterior vitreous detachment was present. I have tried in every macular hole surgery and I am using this for the case of the inverted ILM flap also and for the lamella macular hole or any other case in which I have to put the ILM flap over the hole. What it is doing? It is giving the temporary tamponade on the ILM flap at the end of the surgery, if you are doing the normal macular hole surgery, just tilt the eye towards the disc side, take out the, macular, the colored visco and because of the blue color, you can take out each and every drop of the color visco at the end of the surgery and replace it. The only problem in the inverted island flap surgery is to sustain the flap over the hole till the end of the surgery. So this temporary tamponade is very easy. And it is very reproducible and no additional cost is there. The second thing I am going to... At outer plexiform layer. The second thing is, problem is, in a case of PVR, if the oil has gone after the first surgery, subretinal, how to remove the subretinal oil? In a normal case, the answer is you have to make a big retino retinotomy and retinectomy near the side of the uh, oil and then you have to take it out. Now, I have used two things. One is the gravity. 
the second one is the immiscibility of the oil and the water molecule. So in a glass, if water is there, in, in a glass if the oil is there and you will start putting the pouring the water inside the glass, then the oil will come up because it is less denser. I have used the same phenomena in removing the oil from the eye in the subretinal space. Uh, come here. In this case also, at the end of the surgery, at the end of the surgery, I have found out a bubble of oil was there inside the subretinal space. So what I have done, I have pushed the saline in the subretinal space and because the my retinotomy was on the superior side at around the 12 o'clock. So I have chin down and because of this, the water has gone towards the 6 o'clock and the oil has come towards the 12 o'clock. Just see how I have done the surgery, a small part. I, have, I am injecting the saline. And you can see the oil bubble is there. I am pushing the oil bubble with the help of the silicon tip cannula. This silicon tip cannot take out the oil. So I have removed the silicon tip and by the active suction I am taking out from the steel tip. It will not collapse. So there is no need to make any other retinotomy or retinectomy and you can take it out from a very small hole. You can use it in any type of situation. Just pushing it, the oil will come, take out from the existing re uh, hole. So are you actively injecting the fluid, BSS? If the hole is very small, I have to inject inside the eye, in, inside, in the subretinal so space. So your assistant is injecting? No, I am doing only. Okay. I and am doing the only. the oil bubble is coming spontaneously near the hole and you are actively aspirating the hole. By no, method. first of all, if the oil is there, I have injected the BSS, the oil will come in the superior part. Okay. With the help of the silicon tip cannula, I am sweeping it towards the side of the hole. hole and then you are ac actively aspirating it. Then right? after that, I have removed the silicon tip huh. and from the steel tip, I am actively suck it will easily the suction. It usually gets blocked. Easily, uh, it, the, the silicon, silicon tip. tip will block, but not the steel the tip. Steel tip. Uh, I'll, I'll show you one minute video is there if okay <laughs> colored visco is just uh, okay uh, I'll tell you later <laughs> thank you Dr. Atul for uh, such nice presentation your nice demonstration of your la laminar hole cases as well as the removal of the subretinal oil nice technique now I would like to invite Dr. Shubhendu Boral, Chief Ins Instructor of this course, for his talk. So, uh,
uh, we are almost at the end of our course. So my longest day to treat the diabetic recurrent detachment, it was a like uh, it was a recurrent retinal detachment uh, after treating the diabetic combined RD, and there was large open macular hole. You can see that whole uh, retina is detached at the macula. Lot of PVR changes, lot of membrane formation. So the hole was almost in the size of the disc, 1,500. So lot of membranes around the macula hole and lot of previous changes all around the macula. It was previously a combined retina detachment and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the due to the boggy uh, macula, there was secondary macular hole formation happened. So I tried to remove all the membranes and uh, it was very much retina was very friable and so it should be very gentle to remove the membranes only not to create any secondary breaks. But uh, the membranes were quite tight de adhered if you, s you cannot settle the detachment. So it is almost an impossible case for me because I have committed the patient to settle his retinal detachment. I have to do the uh, complete the my surgery after settlement of retina, but still the membranes were totally uh, thickly adhered to the retina and it was so creating so many of pre peripheral breaks. So I had to do the 360 peripheral retinectomy finally to settle at least the posterior pole. Uh, uh, but the problem is uh, there is uh, there was large macular hole. So what should I do? So the peripheral retina what was uh, left untreated like it was not it was redundant. So I used flex loop and mobilized this flap uh, under the, the PFCL and to keep it over the macular hole. That was the idea of uh, doing uh, a modified uh, autologous retinal graft because the peripheral retina which was little bit uh, is not useful uh, for any kind of purpose. So uh, this kind of situation may happen uh, in your uh, surgery. So secondary macular hole formation po in post-op period in a boggy macula that may happen. So uh, that kind of uh, uh, large macular break, it is secondary macular break, it will not go with the ILM peeling. So any kind of ILM will produce the macular scar or finally close the macular hole, but it will produce end up with this macular scar, but you cannot close the hole. So I have uh, the longer follow up uh, patient also uh, this thing follow up also. So uh, now coming to the complications of the perivalvular block in high myopic patient, like uh, it was a case of cataract with myopic phobioscisis with ERM with vitreous macular traction. I planned for the FACO intraocular lens implantation followed by vitrectomy, ILM peeling and just see it was actually pre-planned surgery and the macula should be absolutely visible, everything should be absolutely clear but on table after just removal of the cataract putting the IUL just have seen there is absence of glow and lot of hemorrhage. So from where the hemorrhage has come, patient was high myop, so there was a chunk of blood uh, was there inf inferiorly so I tried to remove the blood. And finally, the uh, this uh, thick highlight phase, uh, thick uh, highlight uh, highlight blood has been removed uh, gently without creating because the underlying retina is thin. And after clearing all the blood, I discovered uh, just see what happened. Uh, discovered a slit-like break inferiorly and localized uh, like subretinal hemorrhage. So I planned for the, there, I, there was a suspicion of strong suspicion of uh, intracolor perforation. So uh, I was, what I was used to, uh, like uh, supposed to perform, it is the re removal of the ERM and ILM. So I, uh, as the patient was high myop and the uh, extensive uh, macular degeneration was there, I tried to uh, stain the macula uh, under the ear. It was an old video. Nowadays I'm not uh, staining the uh, uh, macula under ear. So again, I put the infusion on, keeping in mind that it may jet cause jet injury. So I put my infusion, uh, this soft tip cannula just overlaying the infusion port, uh, but still it has created superior return detachment. So just see there are multiple breaks in the superiorly, but uh, macula was nicely stained. So I kept my patients, remove all the ERM and the ILM part nicely because uh, finally you have to show the uh, patient that your, your ERM is not there for your crisis and ultimately resolved. So I removed all the ERM and ILM and uh, but still inferior break is there, superiorly localized detachment is there, you have to tackle later on. So that macular part is over, now you can detect there is subretinal ear, 
two, three breaks are there in the superior uh, at 12, 12 o'clock. Now I unified all the breaks because these are the all primary breaks happened during the uh, block, perivalvular block that anesthetist has given. Uh, but uh, there is always, it's not blaming anybody, but it's, it may uh, happen in your hand also. So uh, that is uh, the almost uh, uh, inevitable complications ha can happen during the um, uh, during uh, doing perivalvular block uh, uh, d uh, in a case of high myo. So I barraged all the breaks and injected uh, uh, keep the eye under air, and finally just see macula has improved vision. Finally improved to six twelve, and after four weeks uh, six weeks the vision ultimately six by nine nine retina is absolutely nicely attached, and the whole the sky spot is gone over. So this is my another case of complication which happened during the, uh, due to the inadequate perivalvular block interoperative foveal because uh, there was subfoveal uh, PFCL and it was a silicon oil field dye vision was 20 by 120 and uh, my plan was to remove oil and remove the sub silicon subfoveal PFCL directly. So I am uh, while trying to uh, remove the subfoveal PFCL directly with this 41 gauge metallic cannula, I saw this is jerky movements happening. So. I, I, I didn't, uh, I just ignored the situation and I didn't respect the situation. I just tried to remove the, this, uh, this oil and what happened just is there was bleeding from the uh, almost foveal margin you can see. Uh, I don't know, I don't have uh, intraoper OCT. So, so I finally stopped my surgery. So I uh, planned for the sub uh, tenons anesthesia that is very much helpful in a case of high myop or any case of this kind of situation this subtenous anesthesia is very much helpful. So I removed this sub uh, PFCL, uh, this sub foveal PFCL and PFCL bubble has been nicely uh, removed. But you have to tackle this foveal tear. So I stained the ILM and uh, try to, uh, try to uh, cover up this, uh, this foveal break with this help of ILM uh, flap and kept all the this uh, whole part of the foveal tear because I was not sure the whether this it has created the foveal uh, tear or not but still when uh, the sub foveal PFCL has come out so that means there is some breach in continuity of the retina. So finally uh, I could have uh, saved my face I, I, I had saved my face uh, in front of the patient just see there is no break and uh, no sub foveal PFCL also. Thank you. So these are the situation that may happen uh, in, an, in a very predictable case. Any kind of newer or newer complications we can showcase or I think uh, all the VR surgeons are facing this kind of problem. So your simpler cases can be uh, extensive like uh, you can, it can make your, uh, uh, make your day sets almost like sleepless night. You can just so try to manage all these cases, uh, just justify the, your surgery and also justify their patient. Thank you. So we can have your...